cool. So it should be recording. Um, share my screen real quick. Okay. Whoops, I want to present from the beginning. <laughs> Okay, and I just realized my presenter notes aren't going to be hidden because I'm using this one monitor today, um, but that's okay. So um, I'm Joe Klein. I'm here with Steve. Um, we're going to be doing uh, using census data and research presentation slash workshop, um, and we used uh, slides in a presentation um, that Linda and Steve previously did um, uh, called American Community Survey and Decennial Census. Um, so Jenny, did you want to say anything about the UVL? Sure, yeah, I can say that uh, Joe and Steve already had this lovely session planned and they kindly agreed to have it be on the ULVLC calendar. So if you are uh, interested um, and if they're okay with having the recording up there, we can put it on the archive on that page. Um, and if you're interested in other ULVLC sessions, you know how to find me. So. That's all I have. <laughs> cool, thank you. Um, and I'm gonna try and figure out how to get the chat window up, but I do not see it. So Steve and Steve might have to take care of the chat while I am got it open. pressing next. Um, yeah, so if you have any questions during the session, um, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, we'll take some breaks every uh, section or so and see if anyone has any questions or need anything um, needs anything clarified. And then we also have some more hands-on um, exercise or exercises or activities. Um, for those, I think uh, we'll let you know whether to uh, raise your hand using the participants list. So it's underneath participants. Um, there should be a raise hand button um, or whether to just put that question in the chat um, when we're on those parts. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, so this is a, a comic that Steve put in there. <laughs> um, showing that um, you can separate communities and, and groups of people by age group. So um, this group of businessmen made significant gains in the 15 to 26 year old age group, um, but they lost their immortal souls. I'm guessing they did some sort of advertising or programming. Um, so some goals for today. So we're gonna cover what the US Census is and a little bit of the history behind it. Um, we're going to go over what data um, you should use. So, and this includes data that you would use as a researcher or in your own projects or when you're, you know, just curious about your community um, or what data you should um, forward to other people. Say you're doing a, a shift on the reference desk or you have a student ask you um, or just a researcher or somebody ask you what data they should use. So what should they use? Where should you point them? Um, we're going to go over what the American Community Survey is, um, which is a type of U.S. Census data in addition to the U.S. Decennial Census. Um, and then we're also going to look at how to find and access census population data because um, there's a lot of different sources and places where you can go to look. So Steve will take us off in the beginning. All right. And the first thing we need to do is talk about definitions a little bit and maybe some history, too. So two questions. We're going to pause here for a minute. Anyone want to guess, either verbally or with text, how old a census is? And second question is, why do we have one? So first off, how old do you think, when was the first census conducted? Okay, thank you, Jenny, good guess. It's earlier. Ooh, Caroline, you were dead. Okay, Caroline, why 1790? What happened that year or around that time? Yeah, Caroline's right, it is 1790. Sorry if I didn't say that clearly. Mm -hmm. And you're welcome to, to answer that. you're welcome to unmute yourselves as well and, and talk if you yeah. would like prefer. Yeah, thank you, Caroline. And not just for you, for anyone, what happened between Revolutionary War ending and 1790? What major thing in U.S. governmental history? Specifically, 1787. Yeah, good, Sean. Yeah, yeah. So 1787, we wrote the Constitution, which includes, next slide please, Joe, Article 1, Section 2. So second thing in the stupid sense, not stupid, second thing in the, in the, in the Constitution, I was trying to show emphasis, not make fun of the Constitution, was the need to do an enumeration. 
And this is the current version of this text, so post 14th Amendment. And when was 14th Amendment written? What was the big thing that happened that resulted in that 14th Amendment? By the way? Yeah, what kind of equality, Sean? What was the big thing that happened before, right before this amendment was done? Yeah, good. So we went in. So we freed the slaves. So emancipation. That's part of this rewrite um, for the amendment. And notice every 10 years, um, sorry, looking at the text a bit more, three years after the first meeting of the Congress, and that was 1787. So three years after the Constitution was created, and we created Congress. So we had to do this. Anyone, and th this is a little off topic, but I think given the politicalization sometimes of, of data and census data, and just also our knowledge of history, this I think is still worth a slight digression. So anyone know what this paragraph looked like before 14th Amendment? In other words, the original version. Or in other words, how did they change the Constitution after the Civil War regarding Article 1, Section 2? That wasn't, wasn't there originally. Yeah, you're right. Oh yeah, good guy. Okay, good. You guys are good. Uh, next slide, please, Joe. Here it is, original. And like Sean said, three fifths of a man. So I'm um, sorry, that's old Texas language. If you, you know, listen to uh, political hip hop, Chuck D rapping about um, reparations, this is where you know, he's referring to three fifths of all of the persons. There we go. Um, and again, it's but it's not just African Americans, of course. Uh, free persons exclu uh, excludes. Uh, what's the phrase, Joe? Apprenticeships? No, indentured servants. Sorry, indentured servants, okay. for example. Uh, folks with no property often were not able to vote or were not considered members. And also notice excluding Indians, Native Americans. Um, one more final question and then we'll move on, I promise. But anyone know in what general time period Native Americans got the right to vote in federal elections? Since this does, of course, tell you that they did not consider Native Americans Indians to be citizens back then. And often when I, when I discuss with the students, they, I mean, they know about three fifths of a person um, generally, but they had not as much knowledge about how recently it's been that Native Americans had the right to vote in federal elections. Sometimes they had like right to vote in territorial or state elections, but the federal mandates late. Joe and I actually having asked that question, I've gotten, is it 1920, I think? Does that sound right to you? Or any other view historians, it's actually early 20th century that Native Americans got the right to vote. So that is indeed how long it was ago. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, and one more question, article in section two, second thing in the census, constitution, sorry, is the census, why? Why was it so important for the founding fathers to put this into the constitution so early in it, back in 1787? What's the point of the census, in other words, in terms of how our government is set up? And that's my last history question, I promise. Thank you, Christine. The appointment, appointment of, okay, good, yeah, thank you guys. So yeah, how many people should serve in the House of Representatives from New York State versus Georgia? We needed to know that. And as you guys know, that's based upon population. The uh, Senate, of course, has two persons from each state, regardless of whether it's a tiny state in population like Wyoming or a huge one like California. But as you know, every state gets a prorated representation. And so like 2020 census, one big deal is, should North Carolina get another person in Congress? Should we basically get one at the, um, at the expense of a declining state population, such as maybe New York or Michigan, where I'm from, et cetera? So yeah, that's a big deal. And we couldn't really have Congress meet until we have the House set up. And there we go. And also going back to this, this slide here, three fifths of a person, um, think about the issue, uh, Southern question. I mean, that's how it was kind of defined. Back then in 1787, most of the white persons were living in New England and Mid-Atlantic. Um, but if you factored in the slave population of the, of the South, particularly the Deep South, then their population is much more uh, equal. And that's why three-fifths of all other persons was there to bump up population in southern states so that they weren't dominated 
and seats with northern folks. Um, so that's, and yes, I know there were slaves in all 13 states originally. Uh, I'm not trying to, to make it too simplistic. But that's it, the politics of the census, I think, is interesting. And this is the first example of that. Okay. Thanks, Joe. That's enough on that. Thank you all for that. I think that's interesting. And I, hopefully you did too. Um, but, you know, students need to know that this stuff matters. It defines our, our government. It defines our society and, and rights and inequality as well. And it's important to know about the big picture here. And therefore, we have the so-called decennial census every 10 years. And as you probably know, everyone's supposed to be counted. Every single person in the country, citizens and non-citizens, are supposed to be counted. It's 100%. It's not a sample, not a survey. It's every single person. And therefore, coverage is the focus. The, the questions are pretty limiting. And Joe will show us this when we get into the hands-on part later on. Um, age, race, population, et cetera. You don't get very detailed anymore with the decennial data. You used to, 2000 and earlier, 1990, 1980, there was a long form. Sorry, I'm in chat, going off for our reference. I need to turn it off because it's bugging me in my headset. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Gone away. Um, there used to be a long form that had more detailed data. But since 2010, those detailed questions, which we'll see examples of later today, are now covered by the ACS, which we'll learn about in a little bit. Thank you, Joe. Mm -hmm. So ACS, how many of you have heard of the ACS? Can you get a show of hands or a quick chat response? I'm always curious to see, I think Joe is too, regarding knowledge ACS. So yes and no, okay. And by the way, let me know if my, I'm not sure what on my screen is sharing. So if the chat okay. box is blocking the slide, let me know. No, it's good, Joe, thank you. I see your slide and I've turned on participants in chat. Um, which I can move around, so I'm, I'm doing fine, thank you. So mostly no's, a couple of yeses. Okay, thank you all. Um, and please keep giving us feedback, and I should add this, I talk fast, you all know that. Apologize for that. If I'm not being clear, please ask me to slow down or repeat myself too. So in addition to the 2010-2020 decennial census, we have something called the ACS, which is continuously collected sample data. The, the target is 3 million people a year, and from that 3 million sample, they try to provide full coverage as a survey, not a census, but a survey to make that important distinction for the whole country with data released annually. Um, if, and we'll show you many more details about how the ACS works in a few minutes. But for example, if you live in a place that has 65,000 people or more, a city for example, or a county, then you have annual data about that place with a full range of very detailed questions, not just basic population counts, but like housing data, uh, occupational data, lots of crazy stuff. If you live in a smaller place, small town, a small county, then you have five years data. And we'll talk about that a little bit. That's, I think that's complicated, um, but we're gonna give it a shot, Joe and I, regarding explaining uh, the five-year estimates um, and finally, Joe can talk more about this than I can. She knows more about this than I do. There's also PUMS data, which is available for very detailed data, but usually requiring you to do a direct data download or use a research center for the census, such as the one at Duke. Um, we won't get into that much today, but you should know about PUMS as well. Any questions so far about ACS versus decennial? Oops, I moved the slide a little bit too fast. <laughs> no, it's okay. No, I think we're, we're in a good spot for that. Okay, well, let's talk about that a little bit. This is still me, Joe, right? Yeah. I've gotten, I made some notes about when we're trading off, since I, like you, I can't see our, our text <laughs> notes. I struggle with that, because I only have one monitor as well, so yeah. I just took paper notes. So should you use 2010, 2020 decennial census, or ACS, or other stuff? And then we're going to get into that just a little bit. Thank you, Joe. Mm -hmm. So ACS, okay, annual data, right? You don't have to wait 10 years for it to come out and then wait a year or two for the data to get published. So we can look at annual change. And if you, when you're reading the paper or any news site and there's update on, on say migration inside states or between states or just population counts or aging of America, that is coming from ACS reports. And usually that's because they just released a new annual report updating last year's annual report. And so if you want currency, and you want annual data, then of course, ACS is your baby. You got to use that. Um, really useful for those aspects. Another important point, Linda Kellum made this point, so I'm kind of just quoting her here. As some of you know, the 2020 census hires thousands, maybe tens of thousands of workers to temporarily work for the census, helping collect the data, uh, visiting households. I assume Rachel talked about this 
when she did her program about census collection and getting people to respond to it. On the other hand, for the ACS, they only use professional permanent demographers and survey specialists. So these are professionals who are really good at collecting survey data, responding to gray issues in the data collection, et cetera. So it's professionally done. And according to Linda, that really means a lot. It makes the data quite high quality. Yes, yeah. And you may have noticed, um, I'll jump in a little bit. Please. Um, if you voted um, at the, uh, I guess, I wanna say Kaplan Wellness Center, basically the, the gym on campus, you might have seen some volunteers for the US Census um, handing out surveys or, you know, try, uh, they, there was a small booth out front. Um, so I had a lovely conversation with the lady that was volunteering for them um, or was hired by them. I'm not sure which one she was. Um, and then on the ACS website right now, um, they've actually paused their in-person interviews um, for, you know, pretty obvious reasons. Um, so there's not a lot of face-to-face -face contact. So whether they'll continue those virtually um, is still in the air, but for now they've paused collection of this data. Um, so this is also where currency might come into play, um, where if you're looking for data from, you know, 2020, um, was the data collection paused or, you know, what was happening around then? So um, other things to keep in mind um, about the American Community Survey and any census data that you use are uh, currency and time span, margins of error, sample size and confidence, and geographies. And I'll go a little bit more in depth into all four of these. So for currency and time span, Steve mentioned it already. Um, the census is collected once every 10 years. It's not collected continuously. So it's um, collected on April 1st. Um, and it's considered to be point in time data. So if you're going to be, you know, reporting that the population of the United States in 2010 um, was blank based on U.S. Census, um, that's for a specific year, a specific point in time versus the American Community Survey, um, which is period data. So it's collected continuously throughout that year, um, throughout the year, every year. Um, and the reference period is the past 12 months. So when you say 2012, it's talking about the past 12 months not April 1st of 2012. Um, so this also comes into play um, with the American Community Surveys, um, the estimates, the year estimates that they have, um, which I believe will come up again. So uh, the American Community Survey has those, and which Steve mentioned as well, has the single year estimates, it's got three year estimates, and it's got five year estimates. And I'll get into why in a moment. Um, so when you're looking at the five year estimate, if it's from 2000 and uh, seven to 2012, um, the data or the population estimate for that period of time um, counts for all of those. It's for a period, not for one specific year within that period of time. So you can't say that, oh, well, 2008 had X many of people because the 2007 through 2012 data says so. Um, it's estimated that it would be around there for that span. Um, for margins of error, um, so the American Community Survey figures, the, the, the estimates that they give you are weighted estimates, and they have a confidence interval of 90%. So what does that mean? Um, some of y'all may already know. Um, and Steve, let me know if there's any questions in the chat. I am more than happy to pause at any point. This gets into statistics and stuff that even I'm not familiar with. Um, so I'm more than happy to work through questions that folks have. Will do, Joe. Thank you. So um, census data has margins of error built in to the data. Um, the American Community Survey data publishes that margin of error. So that number may change for the community of uh, uh, survey data. So what this means is that um, you can't get everybody. So for the census, they try to get 100% of the population. They try to get the entire United States, but you're going to miss a couple people. Um, either they lose their forms and don't fill it out, or you know they just really don't want to um, respond to that survey or to that census, um, especially in like immigrant communities and with recent um, news or, you know, hubbub about whether there would be a, um, oh, I forget the, the phrasing, but like the immigrant status. Um, Steve, do you know how they worded that? No, I'm not sure, Joe. Are you okay. referring to undocumented peoples? Or something like that. Yeah, like it was a question about whether people, um, were U.S. citizens, um, essentially. So I don't believe that got included in the 2020 census. Correct. Um, but right, so that could be something that might make someone not want to respond to the census. So um, there are margins of error where, you know, the figure that is reported, the data that is reported might be 
off by, you know, X many people, it might be off by a thousand or so. So um, the American Community Survey publishes that that number and they'll publish it at the bottom of the screen. You'll see it says plus or minus um, near the Albany County estimate. Um, so I'll go back down to that a little bit further. Um, so Census Bureau data has a confidence interval of 90%. And what this means is that, so for example, in Albany County, the population estimate um, that's reported um, from the census, uh, US census, uh, decennial census report um, is 258K people plus or minus 2,191 people. So the margin of error is 2,191 folks. Um, and the confidence interval here means, so we are 90% confident that the true value, you know, the true population of Albany County is somewhere between 258K plus or minus that 2,191. So those are those um, numbers calculated out. So we know that the true population is, you know, probably within those, there's like a 10% chance that the true value is outside of that range. Um, so it's it's a matter of like reliability. So how reliable, how trustworthy is this data? Um, for the most part, statistically, 90% confidence is um, significant enough for you to use that data. Um, and since the Census Bureau will report um, that error, you can uh, also report it, you know, if you're doing a research paper, or if a student is doing a research paper, it's encouraged that they report that error um, alongside the population estimates. So sample size and confidence. So this goes back to the idea of confidence um, in a different way. So samples um, is sample size is smaller for the American Community Survey. So the United States Census or the decennial census, sorry, looks at, um, as Steve mentioned earlier, the uh, household. So it looks at every household, every address, every residence in the United States. Um, the American Community Survey picks, I think it's geographically um, distributed is the phrase that they use. Um, they don't, you know, really tell you um, which addresses. And I believe there's like a one in 480 chance. I wrote it somewhere. Um, That's right, Joe. Yeah, so it's... Um, uh, so you... If you stay in the same house for 40 years yeah. our note, in our notes, then you should eventually get surveyed. Yeah. So if you've moved, like I have many, many times in the past years, the longest I've lived in one place is 10 years and I was a minor at the time. So I would not have had the chance to fill out that um, American Community Survey form. Um, so you might see some folks on Facebook when they fill out the census, they say, oh, I didn't get the long form this year. So they did not get selected for the American Community Survey. Um, so the sample size is much, much smaller. Um, if you're in a smaller city, um, well, I guess I will get to that in a second. So um, if your sample size is smaller, you need more data over time um, to kind of make up for that smaller sample size. Um, so this goes into a little bit of statistics um, in basic terms. So I'm still learning this as well myself. Um, the bigger your sample size, the more data points you have. So this is represented in these pictures, in these images. On the left, you have what happens when you have less, uh, a smaller sample or less data points. And on the right is when you have more data points. So those, those bars or columns are our data points. Um, the bigger your sample size, so on the right, the more data points you have and the less error you have because you have more data points to fill in that gap. So the white space underneath the um, light blue, lighter colored um, trend line, that represents error. It represents what we don't know. It's a gap in our knowledge. So the smaller that white spot, that little white area, the more we know, the less error we have. Um, and then the higher our confidence is that our estimate is correct. To really simplify it, um, this is depending on you know what study you're doing and what sample you have, this may or may not be accurate. But in general terms, the more sample and uh, the bigger sample and more data you have, the less your error is. So for a population like Greensboro, where your population is almost 300K people, um, you're gonna have a lot more data for the American Community Survey than you would for Reedsville, North Carolina, which only has 14,450. Um, and this goes back to when um, they collect the data for the American Community Survey, that those addresses are geographically distributed. So they're not distributed so that each city is represented equally, they're distributed like 
physically, geographically. Um, so if your city has more addresses in it, you're more likely to have more American Community Survey data points. So how do we get around this um, by aggregating data? Um, so the American Community Survey has those one-year estimates, which collects um, data for one year, and then it weights everything and estimates it out. It has a three-year estimate where it collects data for three years, and then they weigh it and estimate it for those um, three years. And then they have five-year estimates. And note that the three-year estimates were discontinued after um, 2010 to 2013. So 2013 was the last year um, that was included in a three-year estimate, I guess, calculation. So they do this one year and five year estimate thing to get more data points. So for Greensboro, which has a population of 300K, one year is sufficient. You've got um, the cutoffs they use are 65,000 people. So if your, your city or your area that you're looking at has more than 65,000 people in it, then you can use a one year data set, which is really nice because then it's more recent, it's the most current. So if I wanted to look at 2017 specifically, I could be confident, 90% confident, in fact, that the, the estimate represents that population for that specific year. Versus Reidsville, um, which has that much smaller population, it's got only 14,450 people in it. So I would have to use a five-year estimate um, because in order for them to get as many data points as we need to get that 90% confidence, we need five times, um, and the way that they can do that is by collecting more years. So that's kind of represented in those circles where when you have five years of that same population, it, it the bigger circle um, that those are combined within equals a bigger population. Um, is that Does that make sense to folks? Does anybody need a, a further explanation of that? This also applies just looking at Greensboro, um, mm -hmm. and we'll cover this or repeat this briefly in a minute. But so we, as Joe said, we can look at both one year Greensboro data and five year Greensboro data. You can choose which data set you want to look at. Uh, with one year data, it will be more current. But with five year, it'll be more reliable. In other words, mm -hmm. margin of error will be lower. So even with a even if you could use current year or one year for a, a place, a city or a county, you can also use five years for that as well and choose if you want currency as a focus or reliability as a focus, which would be the five year. And as Joe said, for Reedsville, you don't get that choice because uh, all you got mm -hmm. is the five year. Yep. Thank you. All right, so I guess now we'll move on to geography. So the last thing to keep in mind um, is geography. So some estimates for different geography levels aren't comparable. And Steve, I think we'll... Yeah, and I love, I, I thank Joe for this. I hadn't seen this image before. This is good. So the core geographies for the census are nested, meaning that they fit inside each other. This is sort of expanding it out. So think of Russian, like a set of Russian dolls. You can picture a set of Russian dolls like coming where you keep getting more and more. Starting with the biggest doll or, or the whole country, you have states. And inside each state, of course, there are counties. And yes, there are the weird states like Virginia, where you have city states that are in, not city states, but cities that are independent cities, not part of the county. Uh, we're going to ignore that for now. Uh, they're mm -hmm. treated too, but most in most states, all the states can be broken down into counties without any, leaving anybody out. Um, and everyone knows counties. That's not such a big deal. And I think this is supposed to be LA County. I've not looked this up in a map. Does that look right? Uh, that Los sounds Angeles? Right. I think that's where yeah. ArcGIS is based, so that makes okay. sense. Oh, so they're being uh, local here. Okay. <laughs> um, inside every county, there are census tracts. And here it's tiny. If you had a county with fewer people in it, you would, you would see fewer tracts, and that tiny little track here in the center of the screen. Um, so census tracts, they, and well, do we have more details? I guess not. Um, they are intended to be about 4,000 people. So I describe the students as being a big neighborhood. When it, something else distinctive about tracks is that they're supposed to be somewhat comparable populations. The people are supposed to be somewhat similar in their social economic status, income, ages, race, Hispanic, which is not a race, and according to the census, it's a different category, et cetera. It's supposed to be somewhat related to each other. Unlike say zip codes, you know, think about zip codes. Uh, zip codes embedded by the postal service, right? They're supposed to facilitate delivery of physical mail. They're not necessarily representative of a standardized group of persons geographically, or although they were connected, but it's not always uh, a shape that makes sense to people who live there, but nor are they meant to be similar kinds of persons inside that zip code border. Tracks are supposed to be 
somewhat similar in terms of the people who live inside them. Finally, you can break down, this is part four in this image, you can break down a track into black groups. In this illustration, thank you, Joe, you can see Joe's cursor, there are her mouse. There's two black groups inside this track. And those are st four standard categories, uh, country, state, five, sorry, country, state, county, census track, <laughs> and black group. Black groups are about 2,000 people on average. It can be actually varied just a little bit, but that's usually what it's supposed to be. Um, and then if you get into the really detailed data that you have access to through PUMS, which we briefly mentioned early on, or using a census research center, you get also blocks and then block centroids. I actually don't even know what centroids are, everybody and Joe. Um, but <laughs> yeah. this does illustrate how these all fit together pretty well. So centroids are the center, um, like the geographic usually, so the physical center of the block. Um, so that's more for ArcGIS. I got this um, image from okay, the cool. ArcGIS resource. I didn't know so. that. Thank you for telling me yeah. that. Okay, next slide, please. Now that we're looking at it, here are all the different geographies, by that word we mean categories of places that can be mapped or just get data for. But if you look in the center column here, it starts with nation on top and ends with census block groups at the bottom. This is that nesting process. And we don't talk about regions and divisions too much. That's, I think, more administrative. It's not very interesting. Regions would be like Midwest or Southeast or West. Divisions would be like subsectors of that. But if you ignore those two, nation, states, counties, tracks, block groups. Those are the big five regarding what we can look up. And Joe, I don't think we want to spend a whole lot of time on some of these other examples here. Yeah. But notice you can do zip codes, sure. You can do school districts, commercial districts too. We need, I mean, gerrymandering, right? That's all That's all about analyzing data inside a commercial district too well, defining a commercial district using this data too. But one thing I want to point out, um, notice coming off of states on the right is places which seems like a very vague general term, right? What do you think places means? What would be included under places? If you could type, please uh, suggest or type what places, what we usually call places in more normal language terminology. Or in other words, what's missing as a kind of location identification from this infographic? Tiffany, good question. Um, I don't know, Joe. Oh, do you know how DC is considered? Is it treated like a state? That is a fantastic There are no counties question. in it. It has census tracts and black groups. Yeah. Um, I'm looking around this list, Tiffany, and I don't know where that lives. I'm sorry. I think it's oh. kind of treated like a state normally with, with but no counties. It just has tracts and black groups. I think that might be why they call it uh, places because it includes towns, cities. Um, I believe you can search there you go. for DC That's the answer. and find yeah. it. Yeah. 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 Okay, maybe it's in places. Yeah, places is what they call municipalities. So cities, towns, villages. This, uh, I live in Winston-Salem, some of you know, for South County. Clemens is not a city, it's a village. It's incorporated under the state government or within somewhere in the government as a village. And so it's it's not a city. Winston-Salem is a city, Greensboro is a city. Townships are also things. If you're from the Midwest, like me, Michigan, we have townships, I'm from a township. Um, if you, the address has a city name, but we don't live in that city. So any kind of municipality is under places. So that's kind of an umbrella for all different categories. Okay. And Tiffany, yes. Um, is this listed here? Territories are included as well. Um, we and actually are, there are separate surveys, censuses, of say Pacific Islands that are still part of the U.S., Puerto Rico, of course, mm -hmm. and others as well. So yeah, we do have census data about those places as well. Yeah. Um, and I want to do a quick aside, actually, back to the, the POMS data that Steve mentioned, the public use microdata. Um, and I'll go back to this slide for that. Um, so if someone could put in the chat, I have it up on my phone, so hopefully I can see them as they come in. Does anybody know why we don't really go smaller than block group? And Steve mentioned, I think you said there were 2,000 people roughly in block groups. That's, yes, that's the target number. It can yeah. vary from like 1,500 to 3,000, I think. Yeah. But 2,000 is the usual number. Okay, yeah. Christine asked, I'm sorry, did, did, can you see that yourself? John? I, I did, yes, sorry, I won't, thank I won't, you. I, won't, I, won't yeah, I opened up the chat on my phone. <laughs> Got it. So um, Christine says, personally identifiable information. So exactly, so the more, the closer you get geographically, the fewer um, people are represented in the data, in the sample, the, the more easy it is or the easier it is to identify those people. So, you know, if there is 
one person that matches a characteristic, say there's one person over the age of 65 in a community, um, if the census goes down into that, uh, say, block group, so there's only one person over 65 in a block group, um, then if you look at that data, you'll be able to tell everything about that one person. Um, and it gets a lot easier to identify that specific person. So you could tell where they worked, how much they made. Um, whereas the census likes to anonymize data. It reports it um, anonymously as possible. They remove personally identifiable information um, and they aggregate data in a way so that it's harder to tell and identify specific people. Um, public, micro, or public use microdata. Um, so public use basically implies that it has been anonymized and it's microdata, so it's kind of at a smaller level. So it tells you a little bit more detail about specific uh, people without giving you personally identifiable information. Um, and this public use microdata is used to um, weigh census uh, data, or I think uh, American Community Survey data or census data or both. Steve, do you know? I can confirm that. Um, I'm not sure, Joe, later. sorry. Okay, yeah, so it's used to weigh um, and to provide more information. So with the census, you only really have um, the basic demographic data. Um, so like age, uh, race, education. So if you want to go deeper and figure out, you know, how many librarians aged 35 to 40 are there um, in the United States, you can use that public use microdata to pull out different data sets and different things and combine them. Um, so that's just a quick aside to there. So you'll see things like public use microdata. Uh, I think it's regions. There's there's like smaller areas that are specifically chosen to get that uh, microdata treatment. So it's not available for everything. So uh, could you please go back to the first whoop. geography page? And I'll, mm -hmm. One more point here. Um, it, might, it might be more relevant to marketing and business students than to say social science students otherwise, but quick point. Um, Quick question, does every state have the same population? Of course, that's an easy question. <laughs> and the answer is no, you know that, sorry, I don't mean that's not your intelligence. Uh, Wyoming has what, 900,000, 800,000? California has like 33 million, yeah. Does every county have the same population? Joe, what's the answer to that question? Oh goodness, I would say no. Do you know what the smallest population county is in the country? <laughs> is it like one? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's Loving County, Texas. Karen and I have been there, um, and it has a population of like 12. <laughs> the main thing in there is a big refinery. We've seen it, um, you know, because we, we were trying to visit all the counties in the country. So we were in Loving County, Texas. Um, I assume New York County, which is New York City, has millions, of course. Um, <laughs> so those are different populations. On the other hand, black group, as we discussed, census tracts and black groups are supposed to be comparable by number of persons. If, for example, you want to find a part of the country that has the most people who drink, say, red wine or like to watch a certain TV show, we can do that with marketing data. But typically, if you do, do that by county, it's always going to be the biggest counties by population in the country or in the state. Uh, big, it, who drinks this the most in the, by county in North Carolina? It's always going to be Wake County, Mecklenburg County, because they have the most people, mm -hmm. typically. But you can use black groups or tracks to say percentages. What percentage of persons um, are most interested in this activity. Sorry, I misspoke there. Um, so if you're doing comparison by county, often the biggest county always dominates the answer, which means for business plans, should every new business go to Wake County or Mecklenburg? No, because we have other people too. If you want to compare total numbers of persons in a way that's relevant, then use census tracts or black groups because each one, as we know, is supposed to be about the same size. Tracks about 4,000 people, black groups about 2,000. So that's comparable with total number. You can really do comparison. And yes, some tracks are big because it takes a big place to get 4,000 people. Like think about rural west uh, versus a census track in Manhattan where there's a lot of apartments. Um, but if you want to just compare counties, you can do that, but the best way is to do percentages. So a percentage of persons in this county are over 65 or like drinking Chilean red wine or like watching the hot new TV show, whatever it is. Um, so percentage data we can use sometimes with marketing data to really compare places regardless of how big they are. But if you really wanna look at total number of persons or households or families, then you have to use black groups or tracks. Otherwise you're just finding the biggest places by population and that may not give you what you need to tell your story or do your research.
that makes sense. I'm sorry, that was a little, that got a little bit long, but mm -hmm. I, I had a class this morning with um, retailing students introducing something analytics. And this was one of my topics. We don't just want to find out what what county buys the most shoes every year, because that's always going to be Wake and Mecklenburg County in this state, but maybe there's pockets. Uh, other cities, smaller cities where they really love shoes. We need to know where that is to do our shoe store there. Um, and so this came up as a topic for that class. Mm -hmm. That's all, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. That's very helpful. Um, and I believe this was actually <laughs> Yep. as well but I conclusion so i think joe <laughs> did a wonderful job comparing these two census is supposed to be official counts that's the census means every single person or thing that's covered acs is sampling um and that could be an issue uh, also remember though the 2010 2020 census doesn't have that much data in it it's pretty basic stuff population counts the detailed information is available through the acs only um, annual data through acs or five-year data if you're looking for a smaller place um, and as Joan talked about quite well, ACS is period of time, like one year or five year span, whereas 2020 census is supposed to be April the 1st, right? And of course, with the virus, that, that's not gonna be the case, unfortunately, but that's that's the, the goal of that kind of project. Mm -hmm. um, and then final, the final row there reminds us that the ACS has the detailed stuff. In 2020, just has basic population counts. Um, so that hopefully that's helpful to compare and to know, like, when should I use 2020 versus ACS data? Thank you, Joe. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're not going to do these questions for now, but this is Linda Kellum's idea. And so we're going to do it too, just briefly. Uh, reference interviewing. We all, whether it's, you know, for work or whether it's because we're curious about ourselves or um, we get asked this question, one of the core issues for any kind of data census data question is breaking it down into pieces, as Linda did here. So for example, here's a question. This is a real question from a student I got once. Um, and the follow-up question is, well, what time period do you want? Do you want 2010? Because that's the most accurate. 2020 is not here yet. I mean, the data, so that's not, not, not an option. Do you want uh, the most current census data from, the Green, from Greensboro, which is 2017 probably right now? Or do you want a five-year span of 2014 or 13, 17 to get more, current, more accurate data, but even though it's a longer time period? So time always matters. Geography. Um, this question defines Greensboro. Maybe that's all you want, but maybe you want to break it down into census tracts inside the county or the city. And then what is the topic? Of course, this question is pretty straightforward. Age and race are the topic. So there you go. Next example, Joe. Mm -hmm. And this was another real student um, looking at starting a private school in Philadelphia. So once again, time period, what time do you want covered? We have to make sure the student answers that question. You can't just jump in and find the data immediately because we don't know what time period that she wanted. In geography, she did said the city, but we can break it down by zip code or census tracts or block groups too. And then topics, um, and those are defined, but Linda just trying to remind us that we always need to ask about time, place, and what. Okay, let I me mean, make that better. Um, where, mm -hmm. when, and why, there we go. Oh, uh, yeah. Those are the, just, things to think about when you break up a question into its parts to then hopefully start finding data that fulfills the need of those people, those students. Yeah, That's and all. I think Linda uses the the five W's and a, and a Y's or an H. So like who, what, when, where, why, and how um, were originally on here. Um, and it's also an interesting uh, thing to note. So if you don't really know the topic of your question, but you know, you want like a specific, you know, I want to know expected tuition costs. Um, that will affect where you go to look um, because the US Census Bureau um, provides a lot of different data between the decennial census, the American Community Survey, um, there's an economic census and a bunch of other uh, programs and censuses, sensei, censuses that they do. Um, so depending on what you're looking for, you might have to look elsewhere or you might even have to combine data sets and use more than one. That's a good point because tuition costs and consumer spending is not census data. That is Bureau of Labor Statistics data, which marketing companies also have. We have, to, we have this data through library databases, but that's not census data, spending how much money you spend, right. um, for example. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. So um, if anybody has any questions, please put those in the chat now. I'm going to take a drink of water before I move on to how to find and access census data. Okay, I'm not seeing anything. So, some sources of data. So there's a variety of tools and sites available. 
Um, so the biggest one right now is data.census.gov. For me, it just shows a white page right now. For you, it might actually load. Um, and I can copy paste these into the chat um, as well when we go to visit them. But for now, they'll be on these slides, which you'll have access to later um, should you want to go and look at these. So there's the official data.census.gov. I call it the census data portal. They don't really have a name for it yet. It just came out. Um, previously, it was American Fact Finder. Um, but right now they're, they have their own single stream data portal. There's also tools like the US EPA's EnviroAtlas and other government agency data portals. So each agency, or at least many agencies, if not each, um, or all of them, they will have their own data portal or their own web map program or somewhere where you can go to view data. And most of them will let you import or search for and add census data, um, just because it's so essential for so many different studies um, to know what the demographic um, characteristics and things of your uh, population that you're looking at are. So for the US EPA and Viro Atlas, they do a lot of things um, involving environmental health um, uh, or environmental, I guess, quality, um, things like pollution and uh, like brownfield sites, Superfund sites that have a lot of pollution and um, stuff. So they'll look at the communities in those areas. Um, we also have a lot of library databases. So the big four are policy map, Demographics Now, Social Explorer, and Simply Analytics. Um, and we have a lot more on the UNCG Libraries Databases page. So just the A to Z databases list, which I have linked here. Um, so Policy Map looks mostly at things behind policy. So they have a lot of things like health, education, um, quality of life data. Uh, social Explorer, um, I think, is just a general social explorer. So it has uh, uh, topics that you can click on to explore, you know, age groups, to explore sex and gender, to explore race, um, and different categories of data. There's Simply Analytics, which um, has a lot more business data, which Steve is more familiar with, so you're welcome to jump in um, for this one. And then there's Demographics Now, which also looks at demographics data. Um, and I'll just show you all what these pages look like real quick, in case you're looking for them later and want to know what it looks like. So I'm in the A to Z databases list. Um, I have it set to all database types, but you could also narrow it down to just data. Um, and I've searched for demographic. Um, so here's Social Explorer, Simply Analytics, Policy Map, the State Data Center, which I would consider to be a government agency website. Um, so states, counties, a lot of local um, websites may have their own data portals. Um, Demographics Now, um, which also has consumer survey data and spending data. All right, um, I'm not going to show you all EnviroAtlas because it is very full and we're not looking at that right now. <laughs> um, but I'm going to go ahead and try to load data.census.gov just to show you all what it looks like real quick. If it works, it did not work, so it's still a white screen for me. You are also welcome to try. Um, that is just data.census.gov. So. The big question, if anybody, has anybody here used um, American Fact Finder or heard of it, or you know, maybe you're curious why it wasn't on that sources slide. Um, so what happened to it? So earlier, um, I think this year, like recently in March, they discontinued American Fact Finder, but earlier this year um, or last year, uh, the US Census Bureau made the decision to discontinue American Fact Finder in favor of data.census.gov. This is actually um, a picture in a jetty. I'm so sad about it. I just got used to using American Fact Finder and they already got rid of it. Um, they had a lot of table options and, and things. So uh, this is the Google search results page from I think two days ago, last Friday. Um, I searched for US Census data and American Fact Finder popped up first um, because they haven't really updated a lot of the site indexes yet. Um, you click on it, it says, please update your bookmark. It doesn't exist anymore. I got super excited when I saw it in Google still. I was like, oh, it's still there. Nope, they got rid of it. Um, and you'll see this um, if you use, if you're on the US Census website, a lot of their links aren't updated yet. So they just made the switch. Um, there are still some things that show, you know, that say American Fact Finder or which aren't correctly linked to the census um, data portal yet. Um, so if you see those, there might be another way to get into the data portal or to find that information. Um, they just haven't linked it correctly right yet. I'm hoping they do that soon, <laughs> um, but we'll see. All right, so how do you find that on the US Census Bureau site? So now that American Fact Finder is gone, 
Um, there's the new portal um, and the U.S. Census Bureau site. I'll just click on this real quick. It is census.gov and I will copy this one into the chat for sure. Ah, actually, I might need Steve to do it. I'll do it. <laughs> okay, thank you. It won't let me pop up the chat. Um, okay, so they've got the 2020 census is kind of highlighted. Um, they've got a lot of other things. They have basic bureau economic indicators, um, population clocks, which is super cool. So we're at 300 and almost 330 million people in the United States. Yeah, million. Um, they also have things for surveys. Uh, quick facts down here is one thing that I want to highlight, which I'll show you all um, later. Um, and then there's a couple of other resources down here, but at the top is the main stuff that we're going to be using. So back to my slides real quick. So quick facts is, well, I guess the census data portal is the first one. So you can get to this underneath explore data. Um, so explore data main, they won't let you click on the tab. You have to click on something within this little button. So here's their new way to explore data. It's data.census.gov. This loads as a white page for me now. Um, I'm not sure if maybe they're updating it or you know what's going on. It worked for me a week ago. So um, hopefully it's not having too many problems, but who knows? Um, they haven't put out any news lately. So they've got um, a couple of resources here. So data profiles, which I will also show y'all, um, which have statistics across topics for your state, county, or time. Oh, and Steve said it did work yesterday, just buggy. Yeah, it's very buggy. They're still working on it, I think. Um, there are tables and maps, which you can access through that data portal. Um, and I'm going to switch back and forth between saying data and data, so please just bear with me. <laughs> um, there's other data tools that you can use. So here's the quick facts page again, in case you need another place to get to it. Um, that was that link that was on the homepage. Um, and then there's other uh, tools you can use. So response rate map, if you're curious about how the response is going for 2020. Um, if you want to look at um, income and poverty estimates and a couple of other things. Uh, my favorite as the data viz librarian is their visualizations page. Um, so they have some cool uh, charts and maps available to help summarize the data sets that they have. Um, they've also got some how to's and information and courses in case you want to learn more um, APIs. If you're doing some hardcore research and pulling a lot of data, I am not doing that um, personally. So if anyone asks you questions about APIs, they do have them. Um, okay. Joe, so before you move away, could you also mouse over uh, in the blue navigation along the top surveys programs, just really quick? Yeah, yeah, and I actually will come back to this okay. as well. Okay, mm -hmm. then I'll wait, I'll wait. Okay. Please hold on, I'm sorry. <laughs> You're good. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna go down um, this part right here at the bottom, number four. Uh, so before I get to what Steve was mentioning, so quick facts. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on that. I'm gonna go from the home page, even though it is available from this data page, um, because this is where most of y'all will find it. I Google it and it pops up, um, but it's on the home page. It's this small square that says quick facts um, and it says access local data. And y'all are welcome to try this out on your own screens if you can do like a split screen setup. Um, I'm just gonna type in Greensboro and it will make you, you have to click on this. I've tried um, to input city several times and I've just pressed enter and it doesn't actually enter it. You need to click on it. Um, so it'll give you a summary um, of, uh, I believe the census, <laughs> um, of what uh, data is available um, for that area, that region that you've selected. So you can also do uh, counties or zip codes or an entire state if you wanted to. I believe by default it has the United States. So you can select a specific fact to highlight. Um, so if you want to look at population estimates, like percent change, um, other categories and it looks like they've got more stuff so this might also include american community survey data um yeah so look like... at let's look at the main table for a second joe before we yeah. get more detailed and notice the different years of data so the first one's 2019 uh, then 18 then 19 and then eventually we do see 2010 and so on yeah. so here's a mixture of acs data all the new stuff and uh, then the old stuff from the decennial census. So this is indeed giving you those options um, to see both ECS data and 2010 census data as well. Mm -hmm. And one thing that you'll notice is this little information icon uh, when you mouse over it, it says quick info. So that will tell you where it's pulling from. Thank you for reminding me of that, Steve. Um, I forgot. Uh, so this is 
from the 2010 census of population of housing updated every 10 years so decennial census data sets and there's links where you can learn more um, and then also they have scope and methodology so how did they come to this figure or estimate um, so for something like computer use so households with a computer um, so for Greensboro 84 percent of folks own a computer or at least households own a computer. So this information is from the American Community Survey and Puerto Rico Community Survey, um, which I believe they consider, they collect that differently. Um, and it's from the five-year estimates, um, since that is for 2014 to 2018. And this illustrates how any you know, detailed data like computer use is ACS data, and not 2010 or 2020 data. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right, so that's quick facts. Um, and one thing to note too, I think, yeah, if you, you have to scroll all the way up for this bar to get to the, for this to show up. Um, so you'll see they have map, chart, dashboard, and more options. So that's using that data portal. Um, I tried to click on this earlier today and it was did not work correctly. Um, but what should happen is it should pop these um, up onto a map for you, or you can chart different um, figures as well. Um, if you click on this uh, magnifying glass next to your city, so I believe it has to be a city for this to work. I could be wrong. Nope, anything. So any place will have um, this magnifying glass, um, which basically shows you where else you can go to look for data. Um, so you can find more data profiles here, which I'll show you all in a minute. So here's a second way <laughs> to get to those data profiles, the first being underneath that Explore Data tab. Um, which will show you either social, economic, housing, or demographic and housing data. Um, I guess housing is in there because this is from the ACS. These, I believe, are a mixture of census and ACS. Um, they have profiles that, that, for... All four of those are ACS, Joe. Ah, so thank you. see the bold is ACS, and then you've got estimates, and then you have bullet point, and then four. So this whole four section is all ACS. Ah, there we Sorry go. Sorry about that. Oh, you're fine. Well, and I'm not sure why housing is in here twice. <laughs> um, so they've got, yeah, there we go. That is what I missed. So the census, general demographic, and then they have other information if you would like to look further. Um, so if you wanted to look at business information, it tells you where you can go for that. Um, they've also got things like congressional districts um, and other quick links in case you want to look at like the North Carolina Data Center um, or other stuff. So lots of more information is available through this too. All right, so that's quick facts. Um, so guidance for data users by topic, including, um, you know, which topic should I use? So I'm going to use income and poverty as an example. I have it linked here, but I'll show you all how I navigate to it using the Census Bureau main website. Um, so guidance for data users is the phrase I look for in their menus. That's the phrase the census uses for, you know, help on picking data sets. How do you use more than one data set? Um, general help. So if you have a student or a researcher, um, who's asking questions or if you are the researcher um, and you will be using this data uh, that's what you would look for to find some help so i have that underneath topic um, is where you'll find this information you'll find it elsewhere but this is one of the uh, i guess quickest ways to find it um, some of these topics don't have a uh, um, guidance for data users section um, income and poverty does, so I'm going to just click on that one to show you all that. So you'll see guidance for data users. Um, sometimes you'll have to, in different topics, you'll have to click on a specific topic to reach that. Um, so different pages will show you different things. Um, so here's a, a big example of that, though. So this basically tells you a little bit more information about what income and poverty related data the Census Bureau reports. So they've got the American Community Survey, the Census 2000, 2000 long form, um, which will just be the American Community Survey um, in subsequent years. Um, you've got the Survey of Income and Program Participation and other um, survey programs slash surveys that they do. Um, so the biggest one that I like is which data source to use. So this is specific to income and poverty. So if you're looking for other topics, it's not as useful, uh, but some other topics will have this sort of table. Um, so it basically helps you decide which one to pick. So depending on what geographic level you're looking at. So if you're looking at a specific state, if you're looking at, you know, sub states of so smaller cities. So I think this one, this one would be Greensboro. So if you were looking for Greensboro, uh, you would look in this section. 
Um, and depending on if you were just looking for straight up income poverty rate, whether you wanted to look for estimates and detailed characteristics um, or year to year change. So it tells you where you can look to find that information. Um, so for oops, Greensboro, you could look at the ACS one year estimates or for this other survey. Um, and that's about it um, versus populations less. You'd have to look at five year estimates because the one year estimates aren't necessarily reliable enough. This one, I believe you, you can also look at the five year estimate, but that one year estimate is going to be more accurate or more recent. Um, not accurate, sorry. OK, so that's the guidance for data users by topic. Um, data by survey slash program. Um, this includes data, narrative, and subject profiles, and this is also um, what Steve wanted me to show. So this is underneath the Survey and Programs tab, and I'm just going to go ahead and click on the American Community Survey because that's one of the ones we're highlighting. Um, they also have the census and other things in here. I think for the census, it might link you to a separate web page since they're not done collecting it yet, so it'll take you to the 2020 census landing page. Um, so under here they've got also a guidance for data users page um, i'm going to click on data and it'll take us to this page um, so this is the landing page for the data that they have available so data profiles narrative profiles and subject tables these had descriptions last time i saw it um, they also have other data options like there's the, the public use microdata sample um, you'll note it says American Fact Finder, so this link no longer works. Um, they'll update that eventually. Um, so data profiles are the big one. And I have an exercise that'll take us through this. So I just want to show you this page real quick um, and show you what the pages look like. And then we'll come back to actually using them. Um, so the data profiles are the most frequently requested social, economic, housing, and demographic data um, from the American Community Survey. Um, they're separate data profiles, so like once you go through this menu, it'll ask you to select one of the four, um, and it summarizes for that single geographic area. Narrative profiles, um, which you can get to using this menu or that first menu that we were on, um, are short analytic reports um, from the ACS five-year estimates. Um, so instead of for data profiles, I believe it looked at yeah, also five-year. Yeah, also five year. Um, it'll tell you what it uses. <laughs> um, so they have different topic areas that you can choose from. Um, and it looks like we can have different areas as well. Subject tables basically have the subjects. Um, so if you're looking for a specific thing, I think computer, so types of computers and internet subscriptions, that's going to be in table S2801. Um, so if you need to find a specific table ID, you can search for it here. Um, in the census or data.census.gov data portal, in theory, you can also search and it'll show you those tables. I've had mixed luck, so I, I prefer to come here to search for tables, um, but it comes down to preference and whether the data.census.gov site works for you. You'll notice this page, it's the same menu options, but the menu looks different. So once again, they're still in the process of updating their website and getting everything to, to match. Um, unfortunately, that means it's a little bit harder to use. Um, OK, so the subject profiles. Um, Steve, did that cover what you wanted to show? Yeah, and you've mentioned this too, Joe. Um, I'll just say it one more time. And just note this list. There's a lot of stuff the mm -hmm. census does that has nothing to do with demographics. So Joe's pointed out economic data, business industry data and so on. So I think I read somewhere in the census in a, like a five-year period, collects data for like 85 different data sets. One of those is ACS, one of those is 2020, oh, yeah. 10-year yes. period. But they do so much more. <laughs> so it, and maybe this is just me being picky as a business librarian, but when someone says, did you use the census? And I say, which data set? There's 85 <laughs> of them. Um, do you mean economic census, county business patterns, sign-up for You know, there's lots of weird stuff they've got. Um, but just encourage us to be precise. Census is a bureau under the Department of Commerce. It's also 2020 thing, and it's ACS, and it's all these other things. So we got to be a little precise about our language um, and not assume everything in the census is demographic data. That's not true. Right. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you for that, that little speech. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So one tool that I like, uh, or 
that I not like to use but have recently discovered is the which data table or tool should I use. Um, and I'll show you how I get to that. So from the Maine Census Bureau website, this is specifically for the American Community Survey. Um, I think other censuses and surveys might have their own. So this is underneath their guidance for data users page again. Um, and they have find the right data tool. So they have this handy dandy little uh, page. So you can scroll through, um, you know, pick who you are. Are you a business owner? Are you a mayor? Um, are you a tribal planner or a congressional staffer? And you know, what tool or website um, would you be most likely to need? So they also have student. So if you're a student, it's recommended that you look at narrative profiles. Um, if you're, you know, giving a presentation about your community, if you're an educator, um, you want information about a variety of topics. So you might want to look at the data profiles and comparison profiles, um, which are another type of narrative and subject uh, profile that you would access on data.census.gov, um, which I can show y'all once I get into data profiles um, or, you know, other different types. So there's a lot of different um, options here that they've included. Okay. So quick exercise. Um, so getting to know the census data table interface. Um, so usually I would show you all the search. Um, the search function for me is not working, so I have to cheat and go through a, a data profile page to get to the table. So I'm just going to show you all um, the tables and how the tables look on the census data portal. Normally you would go and there will be a single search bar. It'll search anything that no, you put in that. It is working now, I think. Oh, it is? Give it a try real quick. Okay. I'm not at the detailed site yet, but I am getting stuff. They timed it perfectly. Okay. Thank you so much. Perfect. Whoop. There we go. So you'll see this page when you click on data.census.gov and I'll paste, boy, we'll type this into my phone in the chat so that y'all can also get to it. Um, and that is just data.census.gov. It'll automatically put in the www and http that you need. Um, if you click on that link, um, so go ahead and click on that link. I will show you all the search bar <laughs> since it is now working. Um, and just please put in the chat if you're having difficulty accessing it. If it shows up as a white page, um, then uh, uh, stay tuned, I guess, um, until I get to the data profile part. All right, so is anybody having trouble getting in? Cool. Alrighty. So you can um, use the search bar. Um, just take a minute, I guess, search anything that you're interested in. So are you interested in, you know, age, sex, race, any of the above, or in a specific place? Um, I believe I have this in the notes of my slides, not the slide itself. So yes, just go ahead, you know, click on stuff, explore around. I'm going to search for Greensboro. Uh, computer because I like to use that as an example. It may or may not show up. All right. So what are y'all's thoughts as you search for things, as you navigate, um, click on tables and maps? And this is just kind of a broad, what are your thoughts? Not necessarily a specific question yet. So like I personally find this very busy <laughs> in terms of user interface. Um, you'll know there's table ID. And Joe, <laughs> notice you have the other Greensboro. I was wondering why population yes. was so small. Thank you. I was saying, well, how does that make sense? <laughs> oh yeah, and that is interesting to note. So if I type in Greensboro, it didn't ask me. Yeah, that's a problem with this interface. Yeah. Uh, but new notice though, we have estimates and margin of error, which confirms it's ACS data. If it was 2010 census, mm -hmm. there would be no margin of error because in theory it's perfect. Yep. Um, but this is sampling, so you will always see that. So whenever you see a percentage uh, plus or minus, you know you're in ACS data, mm -hmm. um, as well as the product line that's up there near the top right, top Ooh. center right. I'm sorry, I'm covering it with the search bar because I'm going to go ahead and Try and get and you would think Joe would prioritize the biggest cities called Greensboro, not, and maybe it's alphabetical <laughs> order. Greensboro GA comes before Greensboro NC. I don't know. I'm just that's my bet. Trying to guess. That is my bet. <laughs> um, 
that's actually really my bet that it's alphabetical um, instead of in a thing that makes more sense like population size or, or number size. Male salary median, 5,000 more. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so comments about the data um, itself from Patrick. Um, well, he's commenting on more larger social issues than the data. Yes, exactly. Uh, yeah, we hear you. Rachel, <laughs> come on. Um, okay, so going on to the, the specific search. So whichever data set you picked or whether you're on just the Greensboro one as well, um, I'm just going to take you all through an, like the user interface real quick just to see what all the buttons are and what they do. Um, so you've got tables, which is what we're under. I'm not going to click on these because it'll take me out of this view. All um, will search the entire census website or at least whatever is indexed in that list so far. I've had difficulty using the all tab before um, and it'll also have these categories underneath in this all tab as well. Um, there's maps, so it'll map this data. Um, I will click on this actually just to see what it looks like. So it'll zoom in on North Carolina. And I haven't picked a specific demographic or characteristic to look at yet. Um, so it's not going to give me anything um, until I pick something. So like total population, you can only really look at one at a time using the map. And it's still having difficulty. I got to zoom out. It's also kind of annoying because it'll zoom super like far in. Um, so, you know, your mileage may vary with this map um, tool. And then pages, I believe is also like the specific um, pages on the census website. So like the American Community Survey page. So underneath tables, if I've selected ACS demographic and housing estimates, the view will default to this first search result. Oh, and Steve says in the chat, if you know Simply Analytics, Simply Map, or Policy Map, um, or I guess Social Explorer, if you're looking at the tables too, um, this is a good comparison of functionality between them. So it'll look a little bit different, but there's some functions that are similar maybe call a different thing. So if you know one already, um, this might be helpful or not. Um, right, so you'll pick your table on the left. This is my first personal problem and I'm gonna try not to harp on this portal too much. Um, but so there's 2,170 results. You can filter them, but you can't sort them. You could download, I believe this downloads the list, um, but you have to just keep scrolling down and click load more um, or else you have to filter it. Um, and I'll show you all filtering in a second. So this product button up here will show you what data sets are available or what tables or products is what they call them um, are available for this uh, thing that you're looking at. So if you're looking at total population, um, that's table B01003 from the American Community Survey. Um, and it's available for these years and uh, estimate year categories. So you can get the five year and one year estimates. Um, does anybody notice anything about the years that are available here? Mostly looking at the American Community Survey. Not that many choices, there we go. So the American Community Survey started, I believe, 2006. Um, it only goes back as far as 2010 here, um, and it only includes one in five years. So it doesn't include historic data or historical past data. So it doesn't include those three-year estimates that were available before 2013, and it doesn't include any data before 2010 for the American Community Survey. Um, and for the census, I believe it does include the 2000 census. It does not include, it does include the 2010 decennial data, I think because I've picked a specific um, American Community Survey choice here. So on the left, oops, let me get rid of this menu. On the left, total population for decennial census is here. Um, so this is one interesting thing. Some people might find this annoying. Some people might appreciate this. They've separated out the census data and this community survey data. Um, and this is largely because comparing the two isn't really a propos um, because they use different methodologies when they're collecting their data. Um, so you can compare the numbers, you know, total population, but functionally they're not really usable. You can't really use them to make any conclusions and compare them um, because they collect that data differently. So, and it's also taking a little bit to load. So hopefully I didn't just break it. Oh, we're still good. Okay. I'm going to go back to this main um, American Community Survey demographic and housing estimates because it pulls out 
um, more categories than just this one total population category. So you'll see estimate, estimate margin of error, so plus or minus 41 is great, I would say. Um, percent, um, so that's percentage of the whole, I believe, of Greensboro City versus just the straight number. Well, that's interesting. Oh, I see. When you break it down into different categories, it's the percent. Um, okay, and the percent margin of error. So this is where they report um, that difference. Whereas for the census, it's always going to be, um, I believe, anything they need to get it to 90% uh, percent confidence. Uh, I could be misrepresenting that. Um, so please correct me if I am wrong, Steve. <laughs> okay. So customized table. So say this is for Greensboro City. Say you want to find a specific thing um, or you want to pick a different location. So here's where the customized table field comes in. And this is a little bit familiar if you've used American Fact Finder. Some things are similar. So the geography filtering method looks a teensy tiny bit similar. Um, so this basically has the same information as before, um, just with some options here. So you can still pick which product you're looking at. Um, you'll have to pick independent years. You can't view them all at once, unfortunately. Um, watch as it does let me. It did not let me do it the other day. Yeah, so it just lets you look at one year at a time, um, which can be annoying if you want to download multiple data sets at a time. All right, data notes will tell you more about that data um, and give you more links, explain any symbols that are weird. So like there's some X's in here. X means the estimate isn't applicable or not available. That could be because of error. That could be because of something else. Um, they'll have selections. So we've got Greensboro, and these filters will be included in here if we click on them. So geography, say I want to change. Um, this is the one that looks the closest to American Fact Finder, except sideways. So if you want to change your geography, I like to do show summary levels. It shows more information that's grayed out. Um, I'm still learning what that means. So if you want to pick like a specific county or let's say a different state. Um, so I want to look at Arizona. It'll pick the state Arizona. If you want to look any smaller, I'll get rid of these real quick so it's easier to read. Um, so if I want to pick a different um, place, which is what Greensboro City is considered, it's considered a place. It'll let you pick within the state, or you can also pick like within urban areas or other things, or you could just search. Um, so I want to search North Carolina. I see Sam. Bye, Steve. Um, you can definitely send out the recording to your faculty. Um, for sure, I'll send that out to, I guess, Jenny at the end at 4.30. All right, so here's where you would pick a different city. So I could pick High Point and it lets you select more than one geographic region and it'll just show up in the table below. So now we have Greensboro, we have Arizona the state, and we have High Point City, which I selected. Um, you have to go into that uh, selections to remove it if you wanna get rid of that state. There we go. So you can compare this way. Um, you can also choose a different topic um, so if you wanted to look at like health and housing and other stuff, it's all in there. Um, you can look at survey. So if you wanted to pick a different survey. So I've had mixed luck using this in this data.census.gov tool. Um, in theory, you can click on different things, um, usually detailed tables, but it tends to not load correctly for me or it will take me into a completely new table. So I'm not going to click on them right now. You are welcome to try. Um, this is one of the things I think they're still working on. Um, and this is also where it gets kind of unclear with what data you need to click on. So this says when your estimates comparison profiles, data profiles, or detailed tables. Um, so it is unclear how those are different. Um, and that might be where you need to click on it and then click on data notes to see what's going on there. So, and it says it's unavailable. Um, and I believe, wait, did it just show up? Interesting. Um, and it says unknown up here too, because it's it's a little bit buggy. Um, 
So yeah, and you can also get rid of the margin of error if you don't want that. Um, you should be reporting it if you're reporting um, American Census or American Community Survey data, um, but you can turn it off if it's easier to read it. Um, you can also filter by different categories, download or map it. Download might let you select more than one year. Hopefully, if not, that's a feature they add. That link's not working for me right now. So, okay, so that's the data.census.gov portal. Um, and a little bit about how to select uh, different geographies. So another way you can get into this and another way I prefer to find data. So for those of you that searched for data, um, it might be very, uh, um, oh, I'm not confusing. What's the word? Frustrating, um, especially if you know you're looking for a specific uh, category. So if you're looking for like, you know, X number of librarians or X number of educators in Florida, um, it can be frustrating to find that data using their search bar, and it's very frustrating to have to scroll through their list of, you know, 2,701 data sets. So I like to look, use the data profiles, if especially if you know you're looking for a specific region or geographic area. Um, so this goes back to what I showed y'all earlier. Um, it's underneath the American Community Surveys page. There's um, underneath their data page, it'll say data profiles. So you can pick um, only to 2014 because they use that five-year estimate. So 2014 to 2010, it doesn't go any earlier than that. Um, I've tried to find where you would go if you need 2006 through 2010 data, but right now I think that is a phone call to the U.S. Census Bureau, um, which will be, I think, my job um, if people need that data. So if you want 2018, and if you want to go ahead, I'll copy this link into the chat. Ah. Okay, so here's that link. That'll just go ahead and take you to the data profiles page so that you don't have to navigate there. Um, so we're going to go ahead and pick Greensboro again. So if y'all would follow along, going to do North Carolina for the state. And it makes you pick from this drop down menu, which is the bane of my existence. Um, it'll show you selected geography, Greensboro City, North Carolina, and then you'll see data profile links. Um, so here's where you go to find uh, those four characteristics data sets. Um, it kind of shows you what it has included, but there's like a dot, 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 which you cannot expand, unfortunately. So um, that is where it's helpful to go into their data documentation to see, you know, what's in each of those. Um, so if I'm looking for commute to work time, I could look at economic characteristics and it'll take you to that same table. Um, so that's a way that you can get around if the um, data that census.gov website is white for you, like it was earlier for me this morning, you can still get to it using data uh, profiles. So you can still access this. Okay. So now that we've looked at that a little bit more, I believe I'm running out of a little bit of time. So here's just a little bit of background within the last couple of minutes. Steve also mentions we're out of time. Um, does anyone have any questions about what we've talked about so far? And what I'll do, Steve, is I'll go ahead and stop at 425. So I will just go through this real quick in one minute. Sounds good. Um, Okay, and then I'll stop for more discussion. All right, so I have this example here um, was a paper from 2004 um, from Adkins and Sturgis. So they basically were looking at how GIS and census data, once again, GIS and data is librarian, um, personal niche interest. So they were looking at how you can use GIS and census data um, to uh, uh, advise, I guess, or inform your library service planning. Um, and this is aimed at public libraries, but I think a lot of it um, relates especially to UNCG and academic libraries and other um, library institutions and museums and archives. <laughs> so they, uh, Arthur's posit that, you know, the more you know about a population, the easier it will be to design services to meet its needs. I don't think that this is a concept that is new to any of us. Um, I think we're all very familiar that we need to know our community before we can design services for them. Um, so one thing that they looked at, the authors looked at in this paper when they were looking at GIS data is they looked at, or census data, sorry, misspoke, they were looking at age distribution, 
um, they looked at you know specifically the percentage of children in their communities the percentage of older adults or senior citizens they looked at what languages were spoken at home and i believe they did this through a proxy so they looked at um what percentage of folks were hispanic um to determine that or, and then they went further and looked at what languages were spoken at home um, so that they could print flyers and um, outreach materials uh, they looked at educational attainment um, so if you have um, you know mostly folks who are uh, high school they have high school diplomas not a lot of folks who have bachelor's degrees or higher education what is the level of reading that you have to adjust for what types of materials would be more appropriate for your community so do you have more people that are looking for journals and academic journals or are they looking more for you know current fiction nonfiction, um, other materials and collections uh, they also looked at occupation and internet access at home. And all of these topics they used to inform the things on the right. So circulation and collection, outreach, staffing, and hours. So it informs their policies. Um, I had a couple of questions to go through um, in Quick Facts. I've got one in the ACS data profile and one in the ACS narrative profile, pretending that you're planning programming for library as if you were, you know, it's Reedsville, but fictional Reedsville, North Carolina. Um, so I was going to have y'all go through the quick facts data profile and um, narrative profiles to see whether these, you know, to answer these questions. Um, so we're running out of time, so I will share these slides and you are welcome to go through and find them. Um, I'll have the answers in the slides notes, um, but I do want to open up the floor for any other questions or discussions that uh, y'all might have or might want to make before we end this here. what I can do too, since we still have three minutes, is I'll keep an eye on the chat. If you have questions, please put those in there. I'll pause for another minute. Um, and then I'll at least go through this first example using quick facts. Wait another little bit. find when I'm looking at my phone's clock, a minute is agony. <laughs> um. Okay. Feel free to continue to type those. Um, I'm going to go using this as an example. Um, we're going to go to quick facts. So using this prompt, um, you're that that librarian at Reedsville, North Carolina's library, you're planning programming. Um, and you can either plan programs for children and teens or older adults and senior citizens. So which one do you choose? Um, I'm going to put the quick facts link in the chat for y'all, but it is also just on the Census Bureau's homepage. So if you guys could go through and find Reedsville, and I'll do it along as well. So here's Quick Facts, the link to it, and it starts you off at a table. So what do y'all think? Is uh, for that specific community, would you would you do children and teens or older adults and senior citizens? Um, Whoops, I shared the link just with Steve. Sorry about that, y'all. So, but I've got it up on screen. Um, so in our fictional Reedsville city, ooh, Amanda so I would say older adults <laughs> based on general knowledge. Right, so general knowledge, if you already know about Rockingham County, um, you might say older adults. Um, but looking at the quick facts from the U.S. Census Bureau, um, so for teens and children um, in Reedsville, there's 19.3%. Um, and this is looking at, I believe, most recent... Whoa. 
there we go, source. So it'll say source next to it. So the 2018 American Community Survey five-year estimate. Um, they have a little disclaimer about the geographic region. So there's 19.3% um, of that, that population for this city um, is under 18 years versus 20.5% for 65 and older. Um, so there's only a little bit more um, older, a uh, little bit more in the older uh, population category. Um, but I would choose if I had to only pick one as a librarian, I would pick person 65 years and over. Um, I also have other examples of that, um, which are a little bit less niche, um, but I believe we are out of time. Um, so I'll stop here again for questions and thank y'all so much for coming. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Patrick. Patrick. Yeah, thank you. All right, and I'll send this recording out. I'll go ahead and stop recording now. So if y'all would like to